He was Canada's Minister of Finance for eight years. He was Ontario's Minister of Finance as well. He ran for the provincial Conservative leadership twice, both times coming up just short. Here to assess and reminisce about the life of James Michael Flaherty. Ernie Eves, 23rd Premier of the province of Ontario. Elizabeth Whitmer, longest serving female MPP in Ontario history who served in cabinet with Flaherty. Janet Ecker, who succeeded Flaherty as Ontario Finance Minister in 2002. Sean Conway, former Liberal Cabinet Minister and an MPP for almost 30 years. And on the phone from Madrid, Spain, Tony Clement, President of the Federal Treasury Board and also a former Cabinet colleague of Flaherty's both on Parliament Hill and at Queen's Park. And I welcome everybody on this sad day to our table here at TVO and uh, to you, Tony Clement, in Madrid overseas. Uh, I thank you all for coming in on very short notice to, um, to join us and reminisce and assess a guy you all knew very well. Uh, Ernie Eves, start us off. What are you thinking right now? Well, I'm thinking what a sad day it is, uh, not just for Christine and her children, but for every Canadian. Um, Jim was a tremendous person. I mean, first-class individual, uh, a very ded dedicated public servant. Uh, a side of Jim, though, that not a lot of people got to see, I don't think, was A, had a great sense of humor, and uh, B, he really was there for all the right reasons. He was there to help people who were less fortunate in society you know, be able to be the best that they could be. And we all talk about his great record as finance minister, and indeed it was a great record. He'll probably go down as the greatest finance minister in the history of, of the country of Canada. You think so? Yes, I think so. Because of the difficult economic times that the country was in when he was finance minister for much of his eight years there. Also, he led the rest of the Western world, I believe, in, in the recent recession. Uh, he led, they followed. And he, in his uh, indomitable fashion, would berate them at times when he thought perhaps some of them weren't coming along quite the way he thought they should. Uh, that would be true Jim Flaherty again. He was very, very you know, passionate about the things he believed in and wanted to get them done. But the other side was he had a great Irish sense of humor. He was a great storyteller. He was an avid hockey fan. And he, uh, for example, when I ran against him for the leadership, uh, I remember having a long discussion with him the morning after, and he, he likened it to a hockey game. He said, you know, the game is over, somebody wins, somebody loses, let's get on with it. And that was his attitude, and it always was Jim's attitude. And in subsequent years, uh, I just recently saw him in Ottawa a few months ago when I was there on behalf of Special Olympics Canada seeking funding, which he granted us for, for, for a five-year term. And that's the side of Jim, um, learning disabled people, young children. He was passionate about that. He was passionate about helping kids with autism. He was passionate about Special Olympics and help, helping kids be the best that they could possibly be. He was there for all the right reasons. Tony Clement, I know it's uh, 1 o'clock in the morning where you are right now in Madrid, Spain. So let's just you and I chat for a little bit here and then we'll let you go because I know it's been a long day for you. Uh, I'd like to know, first of all, since you're over there, how did you get the news that Jim Flaherty had died? Well, uh, thanks, uh, Steve, for having me on the show. I, I was uh, in the midst of a bunch of meetings uh, and uh, over here, uh, official meetings, and uh, just uh, these emails started pouring in. And, uh, uh, you know, FYI, there's a rumor going around. Uh, that's how these things start. And then uh, in quick succession, uh, it got confirmed. And, and it, it, i got to say, it just took a while to sink in. I, I think I'm still processing it, uh, because it was just like he was here today, and now he's not. It, it's it's just so sudden. And I know he was fighting some health issues, but my thought was always that, you know, when he had the burden of the finance job, which is a huge burden on any human being, when that was lifted from his shoulders, I was expecting to see a spring in his step, and uh, he was going to have that, you know, he was going to be healthier, uh, all round, and then I, I had this image of him doing some stuff in the private sector, perhaps. But I, I always thought he had enough rocket sauce uh, still in the tank that he'd, uh, he'd do something else for the public sector or uh, for the greater good of humanity somewhere along the line. And, and that's just all gone. It's it's, it's just hard to fathom. Now, I, I think I'm right when I say you sat beside him in the House of Commons for the past many, many years, and I, I wonder if you ever had a conversation with him that went something like, Jim, you don't look well. You've got to take care of yourself. You've got to do something else besides this. Did you have the kind of relationship with him where you could say something like that? 
I didn't say it that directly. I, I did. I did take the time to, you know, to inquire about his health and, uh, uh, you know, how are things going, Jim? Do you feel like, you know, that the, the medication is working? And uh, sure, I, I, I inquired on his health. Uh, I, you know, Jim. Jim makes his own decision. <laughs> He's not going to listen to his uh, his wingman. Uh, so, but I, I, it was one of the greatest the joys of my political life to sit beside him in the House of Commons. Uh, you know, uh, for eight years uh, and eight years of budgets, uh, and uh, many of those John Baird was right beside us too. So we really felt like we had maybe done something special. We had our stint in Ontario politics, maybe made it a little bit of a difference there, and yet here we were uh, making a difference on the national and international stage. And so that was something that the three of us held as very special. Gotcha. Tony Clement, thanks a lot for staying up late for us, and uh, all the best in the days ahead. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Elizabeth Whitmer, to you now. Recollections of Jim Flaherty. What are, what are you thinking right now? Well, I uh, received the news today as I was driving from uh, my personal assistant, and uh, she had heard a rumor on Twitter and said, uh, you know, I hear Jim is gravely ill, and before too long, as she was talking to me, we, we got the news that he had passed away. And I will tell you, I was very sad. Um, he was a remarkable human being, and I think not all people knew the true Jim. The true Jim was a very disciplined person. Um, he was hardworking. He, he could be tough. Uh, he certainly took strong positions. But he also was very respectful and was prepared to listen to the other side as well. But he was also very passionate about people, and um, he, he really has done a lot throughout his life, both he and Christine, for those people who have, have disabilities. And, um, and, you know, he often had a twinkle in his eye. I think that's something I remember. He did have a sense of humor, but he had a twinkle in his eye, and um, he, he truly was a remarkable human being, and I think he, he is going to be remembered as a great, great Canadian. And he very, very quickly, once he got to Queen's Park uh, in 1995, uh, started to exert a lot of influence within our caucus and within our cabinet. And of course, both Premier Harris and Premier Eves uh, looked to him for leadership in, in cabinet. So, uh, you know, you can count, you could count on Jim to do the job and to do it well. Senator Decker. Well, I think, uh, and actually Elizabeth uh, mentioned it, that sort of Irish uh, impish uh, part of him, which you sometimes saw a flash of. But uh, what was really interesting about Jim, I mean, when he and I, we were sort of uh, uh, candidates together, if you will, before we won election in 95. And uh, the two of us uh, and our other colleagues out in Durham Region will get together before the election, meet regularly to talk about what we could do if we all got elected to help Durham Region. Um, and uh, uh, and when he, when you know, when we we did, and he was true to his word. I mean, things like the Highway 407 expansion into the riding, the Durham University, the the Ability Center, which is a state-of-the-art uh, uh, facility for uh, families with children with disabilities. I mean, it was a really long list, and uh, so it was always good to 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 be able to work with them, even when you know we didn't agree from time to time on the odd issue. Um, that was okay too, because at the end of the day, I mean, Ernie said it well. You know, I mean, you're there to do what you think is right. You're there to make decisions, to argue for what you think is right. And uh, but at the end of the day, we work together to do a lot of good things out in, in Durham Region. And so uh, uh, I admired him. I respected him. He's been incredibly supportive of what we've been trying to do for building the uh, Toronto financial services industry. Uh, we established the, the Global Risk Institute uh, to sort of uh, help uh, leverage our global reputation and risk management. I mean, it, it's just the list of things that that man accomplished uh, in provincial politics, federal politics, um, is just phenomenal. It's a very long legacy. I think the other thing uh, that, uh, you know, while most historians or whatever are going to look at his contribution as uh, uh, leading Canada's economy uh, during the recession, which was no insignificant feat, um, uh, what a lot of Canadians don't understand or don't appreciate is, like, he's almost a rock star out there in uh, government financial services land uh, around the world. Where is that exactly? Yeah, well, I uh, we did an event a couple of years ago he came in, in in New York and I mean I couldn't believe it I mean we had like it was a sellout crowd we had CEOs of major uh, American financial companies that just sort of you know when our consul general called and said we're having a little dinner with Jim Flaherty 
canceled everything and they came. Well, he was the dean of oh, all of absolutely. the absolutely international yeah. finance yeah. ministers. So it, right? it's, it's an end. incredible legacy that he lives. Okay, he all all of you knew him obviously as a caucus or cabinet yeah. colleague. You did not. You were a guy who was on the other side of the floor, sparring with him, perhaps. So, what's your take on him? Well, that reminds me of uh, I think a good story. I remember Jim sitting in the front bench, uh, probably between. Ernie and, uh, uh, and one of, or both, uh, my two distinguished female colleagues here. And I was looking at him, uh, trying to think, who does he look like? He reminds me of somebody. And uh, finally the penny dropped, and I went over, because he saw me looking, and he said, have you got a problem? And I said, well, I'm <laughs> trying to figure out who you look like. And I said, I finally figured out who it is. And it's a young Jack Dempsey. Uh, the, and he was quite flattered by that. The prize uh, fighter. The uh, famous <laughs> Irish-American yeah, yeah, heavyweight he would, champion. He would, yeah. And uh, Ernie reminded me of this, that um, when I think of Jim Flaherty, I think of someone who liked his politics muscular. Um, he was kind of a male edition of Betty Stevenson. I mean, he really did like to be <laughs> engaged. He didn't, there wasn't very much neutral about Jim, as far as I could mm -hmm. tell. He was iconoclastic. He would come at you sometimes, as I suspect, uh, Janet uh, and others here know from perhaps a slightly different angle. I, I remember, for example, his views on, on the homeless were, were quite, shall we say, idiosyncratic uh, relative to the rest of the political class. But he was very independent. Uh, he was not afraid to take a position. Uh, and as I think is quite obvious from the, uh, the outpouring on Parliament Hill, a place today that is quite, uh, quite a different place than it's been in, in recent decades. Uh, someone who clearly was really well regarded by all his colleagues. It's one thing to hear the Prime Minister and members of the government caucus saying nice things, but uh, the leader of the opposition, Mr. Mulcair, was visibly moved, I thought, in his comments. I thought Charlie Angus, who's quite a colorful new Democrat from Northern Ontario, had a wonderful story about being in Rome with Jim Flaherty recently, and uh, he, he conjured up an image that I think if, if, uh, if you knew um, uh, Jim, as, as Elizabeth Whitmer has said, uh, there was uh, a quality about him that you just could not help but like. We will show some of uh, the tape of those comments of earlier today in just a moment. But first of all, this seems like a good time to remind people that he had a very long career in politics before he was the Minister of Finance. And I want to go through some of that just right now. Here's the board on James Michael Flaherty, born in 1949. He practiced law for 20 years before he even tried to run in politics. He ran in 1990, and as so many successful politicians do, he ran and lost. But he tried again five years later and came in on that wave of Mike Harris's common sense revolution. His first job was Minister of Labor. Four years later he was appointed Attorney General. A Couple years after that he was Ontario's Minister of Finance. Then the government changed. The guy sitting across from me, Ernie Eves, made him the Minister of Enterprise, Opportunity and Innovation, which he called the Ministry of Vowels. He tried twice to become the leader of the Ontario PC party, but lost both times, once to Ernie Eves, once to John Tory. In 2004, he decided to go federal. He became a member of parliament. His wife, Christine Elliott, ran and won in his stead in his provincial seat of Whitby Ajax. She, of course, still holds that seat. In 2006, the government changed hands. The liberals were out. Stephen Harper's conservatives were in. Uh, Mr. Flaherty was appointed the Minister of Finance, and I'm not sure how many people know this, but he is the longest serving conservative finance minister ever in Canadian history and number three on the all time list. And apropos of those comments you just mentioned from Tom Mulcair, Stephen Harper, uh, Tim Hudak, Rob Ford, we are going to hear from all four of them right now, so check out the monitors here in the studio. Here are some comments from earlier today. Roll tape, please. Dear friends, uh, today is a uh, very sad day for me, for our government, and for all of our country. I learned a short while ago that our colleague, my partner and my friend, Jim Flaherty, has passed away suddenly today. Catherine and I want to express to Christine Elliott our profound sadness at the, the departure of our friend, Jim Flaherty. All his colleagues here in the House of Commons share in that loss. He's a good person. Jim served in the provincial legislature with my late father, Doug Ford Sr., and was a close friend of the family for many, many years. And I can never thank him enough for his friendship and his loyalty through the years. You saw the man, and you saw the huge heart. You saw what he's made of. Sad reality is gone. Never had a chance to say 
you never have a chance to say goodbye and thanks. And I had a chance to speak to Mike Harris earlier today. He, of course, ran for Mike Harris in 1995, and here's what Mike Harris had to say about his old friend. He said, I just talked to Jim yesterday morning. He didn't sound strong, but he did say he was looking forward to the future, spending time with the kids and his wife, Christine, and making money. There was no indication he wasn't well. He said he felt fine. It's a shocker to me. It's very sad for Jim, who deserved some time post-politics, and even sadder for Christine and the boys. He deserved the next 20 years. He made a significant contribution to public life. He had an enormous impact politically. And that's where I want to pick up Ernie Eves. He had enormous impact politically, says Mike Harris. How so? Well, I think that, uh, as others have alluded to, as Elizabeth just said a few minutes ago, he certainly had certain ideas that he fought for, that he believed in vehemently. So was he a and bull in cabinet? No, he, well, he, he wasn't a bully. He was a bull in cabinet. I said a bull, there's, not yeah, a bully. There's, there's, but he was a bull. There's no doubt. If, if he believed in something, uh, you knew about it, <laughs> and you heard about it for much of the cabinet meeting. And, you know, he, he was a fighter uh, in, in every aspect of the word, not just for, for financial causes, but as I said earlier, for social causes. And if he really believed in something, he fought tooth and nail to get what he thought was the right thing. As somebody who used to be finance minister, you succeeded him, right, mm -hmm. as finance minister in Ontario. He's a guy who hated deficits. Mm -hmm. He brought in the biggest deficit in Canadian history, $56 billion yes. to fight the ravages. He never did things by half measures. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, he brought in a deficit that big, he said, to fight the ravages yes. of the Great Recession. But I wonder how tough a conversion on the road to Damascus that must have been for him. You ever talk to him about it? Well, I think though people, uh, uh, you know, like to see him as a sort of an ideal log, that, and that was all there was to him. And uh, he had very strong views, absolutely, very strong beliefs, very strong core about you know, principles about what he thought was right, which which made him a good politician because you you know too many don't have that kind of core, and you can get lost quite quickly. But what you also saw was a man who was smart enough to know that action needed to be taken. You had to do something in an extraordinary situation to help literally save Canada's economy, save the jobs of Canadians, help, you know, sort of uh, save the financial system, etc. So um, he saw the need for that and he did it and did it quite quickly. Did it with, as I said, not half measures, did it very, very well, but then also had the very unique ability to start reining back on the government spending. And I got to tell you, there's very few governments uh, uh, I think who've been able to um, go from from balance to deficit for good reasons and then bring it back to pretty well balanced when he left. So that's a significant accomplishment. Okay, but I'm trying to imagine, did you call him after he brought in that $56 billion deficit and say, hey, Jim? Well, I think I teased him a few times. I was going to say, yeah. if I can imagine. Is this I, the guy, because I can remember suggesting once that we might think about having a $1.2 billion deficit, and I certainly heard about it in cabinet. Um, <laughs> So I did have a little fun with that, but but he, he took it from whence it came. I mean, he yeah. took it good naturedly, and as uh, you know, as Janet has said, he realized that something dramatic had to be done uh, to deal with the current, the then current economic recession, and it was quite significant. And there was nothing half-hearted or half-measured about what he did. Whatever he approached, it was 110 percent full in. Did you, on the other side of the floor, regard him as an ideologue? Well, he certainly was a different kind of conservative than those of us who were elected in the mid-1970s had been used to seeing. Uh, and those of us who knew Janet Ecker, for example, uh, thought her colleague from uh, next door in, in Whitby seemed to be uh, robust in ways that uh, those old moderate centrist red Tories didn't always uh, uh, match. But uh, Jim was a really good athlete. And like all good athletes, he knows that sometimes you have to adjust your game to win the game or to survive into uh, the next quarter or the next, uh, the next uh, period. And uh, uh, I think he, uh, he also grew. I think Jim Flaherty was someone who began, I think, with a very strong set of views, which are perfectly understandable. And then once uh, summoned to cabinet uh, uh, and having to make decisions for a province as diverse as Ontario, a country as wide ranging as Canada, he understood that uh, it wasn't just going to be your way and your way alone. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is for anybody who's interested in a career in politics, that uh, 
litany that you read off uh, conveys a couple of really good points. Uh, Jim Flaherty ran first in 1990. He not only lost, but he came third. Five years later, he ran again and he won. He got to the near top of Ontario provincial politics. He made no secret of the fact that he wanted to be party leader. He wasn't successful at a time when it did not look like we were on the cusp of uh, uh, very significant conservative dominance in national politics. He made the move. And a few short months after losing the provincial leadership, uh, why he's the Minister of Finance for Canada, and as you said, the longest serving Minister of Finance for any conservative government in 140 years. Uh, let that be a good example to people who think the script of politics is, uh, is of a certain kind. Sometimes uh, you have to not only be adjustable and flexible, but you have to be willing to take risks. Jim Flaherty took risks and they paid very handsome dividends. And while you're on the subject, I think in that great litany of his career that I put up there, I think I got one thing wrong. I think he got elected in 2006 federally for the first time, not 04. We should probably check that, but I think I might be off I on a couple John of years Baird there. I get John Baird and Jim Flaherty mixed up. I'm not I so sure he didn't get the same time. I think they ran the same time. Time. Yeah. The same time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Because we mm. had the uh, by-elections, and both Baird and uh, Jim's riding, I think we Worked had together. Yeah, mm. together. Yeah. Okay. I, well, one of the interesting things about the people who are gathered at this table as well is that you ran against him for a, the provincial PC leadership and you ran against him for the provincial PC leadership, and you were helping him win, and there was and some very did. colorful exchanges. <laughs> oh, we're going to get into that. We're no, going to get into not that. No, that's what we're here to do tonight. No, in fact, we are, because, you know, it, 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 certainly we're going to pay, we're going to give the man his due, but we want to get a complete picture of who oh. he was, and one of the people that he was was the most right-wing of all the candidates running for the leadership, and you guys let him know that. Shall we continue? Do <laughs> you want me to say it? I remember when he suggested that in order to fight the scourge of homelessness, that it would be better to put homeless people in jail rather than have them freeze on the streets. And you remember what you called that policy idea? I know that I disagreed with him. Well, <laughs> you went a little further than that, if my memory is correct, uh, Ms. Whitmer. I think you said that policy idea was disgusting. <laughs> Uh, was he too right-wing for you? Well, let's face it, we were all in the leadership race. I think there were five of us, and we all had our differing opinions. And uh, certainly on that particular issue, you know, I expressed my views. But that's what happens in leadership campaigns. We all express our views, our opinions. Obviously, we uh, take some exceptions sometimes with the views of others. But I think, as Ernie you know, mentioned before, at the end of the race, uh, we all continued to work together. Is that really hard. true? True. The day the race is over, you guys all came together, Do hunky you know dory. What? I don't think there were hard feelings. Um, you know what? I think you go into politics knowing that at times you're going to disagree, just as people do every day in the house. People disagree in the house, and you walk out, and you're still friends with that person. Okay. And, uh, Twelve years ago, you competed against him for the Ontario PC leadership. You won. He lost. How tough an opponent was he? He was a very tough opponent. <laughs> I can remember being uh, pursued by the Pink Panther and the I Waffle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for, for people who don't remember, explain what that was all about. Well, uh, I think Jim thought that perhaps I wasn't strident right wing enough on some aspects. So he, uh, he had uh, uh, somebody dressed up as a giant Pink Panther and as a giant Waffle following me around. Uh, it was, it was kind of humorous. Suggesting you were a kind of a pink Tory as right. opposed to a true right. blue Tory. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Ernie, I was worried a few moments ago that our friend Pagan was going to roll tape on that. <laughs> <laughs> I do really we might. don't need to I see the yeah, I should have. Yeah, Yet, you know, when all that was said and done, you know, the conversation we had the day after the leadership, the morning after, was very amicable. Uh, I asked him what he wanted to do, and he said, well, you know, I mean, I'm being brutally honest here. He, he said, if I can't be finance minister, I'd like to be economic development, but I'd like you to put more things into it. Hence, the Ministry of Vowels, as mm -hmm. I think John Baird and others nicknamed it. But it was done with all the intent of giving him the power about economic development that he wanted. Because I realized what a tremendous asset he was mm -hmm. and what a tremendous opportunity this was to have everybody working together as a team. Now, Janet, you didn't run against him. But he did pull a fast one on you one year, and I'm going to remind you of that one right now. Uh, if I recall, you're education minister, he's finance minister, mm -hmm. he brings in a tax break for people to send their kids to religious and or private schools, and you didn't know anything about it. And you're the education minister. Tell us about the conversation you had with him after that happened. <laughs> 
Oh, we didn't speak for a little while, actually. <laughs> That's uh -huh. what I'm guessing. Yeah, no, and actually I had, uh, I was aware that it was coming down uh, the pike, uh, and the Premier's office had told me that it was happening. The uh, Premier's office told you, but the Finance Minister didn't? No. And uh, we actually mm -hmm. had a, a really interesting meeting. Mike, uh, Mike had a meeting between he and Mike I. Mike Harris. And, yes, and a couple of the team, and we talked about it. And, and uh, um, one thing I will say about Mike, I mean, Mike always, uh, you know, you, you, you always had an opportunity to argue the case. Some you won, some you lost. But I had an opportunity to make my point in my case. Um, anyway, lost that one. Um, and, uh, you know, so he went forward and put it in the budget. But, uh, you know, finance ministers do that. Uh, they're the finance minister. They make the call. He thought it was the right thing to do. Actually, the ironic thing, of course, is that when, when Ernie won the leadership, I got to be finance minister, I got to implement it. <laughs> so, uh, politics You're is welcome. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, politics is a very fun That's game. That's a strange business. It is, yeah. But, you know, but, but I was just going to say, I mean, but we, even though, obviously, we, you know, we had a bit of a disagreement on that, um, we were able to continue to work together. As I said, you know, uh, uh, there were a lot of things we accomplished together in government and in the ridings. So, at the end of the day, politics is about having beliefs. And I think a lot of people forget that. So, and he's been, I mean, and listen, and the working relationship, I mean, when he went to Ottawa, I I think, frankly, the leadership losses actually made him because you come out of that, you learn. You know, you, it, it, they're terribly painful. Um, but he went up there and did a fabulous job as finance minister. And I don't think he could have been that good if he hadn't had the experiences that he had in Ontario politics. And Steve, just to pick up on the exchange with with Elizabeth and, and with Ernie, uh, the, the Jim that I knew, and I obviously didn't uh, serve with him as as closely as my colleagues at this table. But the thing about Jim that I liked, in in that sense, he was very much as I remember my old nemesis, Betty Stevenson. They liked a good scrap, but <laughs> Yeah. But uh, but after the scrap was over, you could go and have a perfectly pleasant chat with them about the hockey game or or you know Betty's no latest hurt feelings. Man. Well, not in my experience. I mean, as I say, and, and the impression I had with Jim, and I didn't have that many uh, encounters, but I had enough that the sense I got from him is that he expected uh, what I would call a muscular engagement. He. Uh, and in that sense, he really did remind me of Betty Stevenson. I, it took me a while to figure out what Betty wanted was a good scrap. And if you didn't have a position and you weren't prepared to uh, defend it aggressively, then really, maybe you weren't worth talking to. And so I found Jim Flaherty in that sense uh, very muscular and, and, and quite, uh, quite engaging. And, and, uh, and he, when he, as an opposition member, I was told no uh, very directly on a number of occasions. And it was very clear and quite frankly helpful. One of the most, I suspect, historic things he did as finance minister was cut the GST by two points. Now. Before you were Premier, you yourself were a finance minister. Did you think that was good policy? Well, I thought it was the right thing to reduce taxes. And I think that uh, the choice becomes then, do you, reduce, do you reduce broad, for example, based income tax cuts, corporate tax cuts, or do you focus on a particular tax? And I think they decided to focus on a particular tax. But regardless, it puts more money back into the economy. But would you have cut that tax that much I don't at know because I wasn't there debating right. that issue at that time. We had a similar debate, you know, at the beginning of the Harris government. And you didn't do and, it. And we decided, it was part of our campaign, that we would reduce income taxes on average by 31%. Mm -hmm. And we did. But you, but you know, there's two other things. I mean, he, uh, you know, they harmonized the sales tax, which, we you know, with Ontario. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, an example where, I mean, he wasn't known as being a great defender of the McGuinty government. Uh, and yet they were able to work together and do that, which I think was a very good thing for the economy. But secondly, I mean, he created tax-free savings accounts. And those are going to turn out to be, I think, a, you know, an incredibly significant benefit for, for individuals and families. So it's, it's a very good record. And at the end, he, as a very senior minister of the Crown, uh, was quite prepared in a very public way to say to the leader of his government that maybe we should rethink income splitting. And a reminder yes. that uh, he was very independent. He was not only prepared to state his case, but he was prepared to amend his position if, in fact, as clearly several years uh, in the finance department had probably given him some reason to believe that maybe that deserved a second look. That Whether, was, in fact, it happens is another matter. That was off script, though. Might and have been the off PM script. gave him a bit of a dressing down well, on that. But it also reminds me of something else. Again, at a, day, at a time when a lot of ministers feel like they are only about a script that somebody else has written, Jim Flaherty, at the beginning and at the end, was quite prepared to say, you want to know what I think? 
Here's what I think. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, do you recall a particular moment in cabinet where you might have had uh, one of those pugnacious moments with him? Well, I think there were many. <laughs> <laughs> they all blur, uh, don't they? Elizabeth? And, and yeah. the reason I say that is because uh, when uh, you know Mike Harris became premier, we had a very active agenda. We were making a lot of changes to a lot of legislation, introducing new legislation. And uh, so there was healthy debate, and uh, oftentimes there were people around that table who had very, very differing views. Jim was one of the people who did not hesitate to share his opinion. Is that a way of saying he was a bull in a china shop in those meetings? No, no, no I would not say that. Not at all does he stand out, but you know, he was prepared to speak up. There are people in cabinet who just listen to the conversation and don't contribute. Jim definitely did speak up. And uh, obviously at the end of the meeting, you know, we reached some sort of consensus, but he was always prepared to put his views on the table, but at the end of the day recognized that perhaps there were other points of views and uh, w respectfully listened. So I'm, that, well, that's what I wanted to get at, because clearly yeah. everybody I've heard today said the guy wasn't afraid to share his views. That's was he right. a good listener, though? I, I think he was a good listener, and I think the fact that his last, you know, thoughts were about making changes to a financial position that wasn't consistent with his leader's position indicates that he was very thoughtful and I think he thought a lot particularly in recent years about the people that were going to be impacted by these policies. Let me follow up with Ernie Eves on that because of course the most important relationship I think in any cabinet is between the premier and his finance minister or the prime minister and his finance minister I should say his or her of course. Um, you and Mike Harris, I think when he was Premier and you were Finance Minister, had a very close relationship by all yes, accounts. And, and, and I think it's imperative mm -hmm. that there is that trust between those two individuals. Did that exist between Stephen Harper and Jim Flaherty by the end? That's what I'm wondering. I think, I think it did. Yeah. I mean, I think there was immense trust there. I don't think uh, you know, Prime Minister Harper would have left him there that long mm -hmm. if he didn't really think that he was the guy for the right person for the job. But he did take him to the woodshed a little bit on well, the income splitting issue. There's always differences in opinion. I can remember several times that Mike and I didn't exactly agree on certain issues and I got, bit, I, got, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got a bit of a dressing down in cabinet Not a few times. Not publicly though. Not but, publicly. But you know, I, like Jim, I expressed my point of view. It might have been different than my leaders at the time, but you, you say what you have to say and at the end of the day, consensus will decide what you're doing. Did you find he was a good listener? Yes, I did. Um, he, he may not agree with you, but he could be swayed by fact mm -hmm. and, uh, and by argument. And I, I think that's a strength. I don't think that that's yeah. a weakness. I do want to talk about his relationship with the province that he represented. Because even though he, uh, you know, he clearly didn't like the Liberals governing at Queen's Park, but he did seem to talk down the province quite a bit, Janet, from time to time. And I guess what... I don't know if I should say the province. He certainly talked down the government of Ontario when it was led by Liberals a lot. Yeah. Do you think that was helpful at the end of the day? Well, I think, and, and you saw him kind of pull, pull in a little bit after he, he, uh, he made one a couple of comments that ended up on the front page everywhere. But I think, though, I mean, for me, watching him, you knew where it was coming from. I mean, his passion for the province, his concern, and again, I'm sure, I'm sure Minister Duncan and, and Premier McGuinty at the time wouldn't have agreed, but Jim believed very strongly that they were taking the province in the wrong way. Right. It, it's his province, it's his riding, it's, you know, his family here, his sons, their future. Um, and he cared very, very passionately about that, and so let it rip uh, publicly. And uh, um, it uh, usually, you know, ministers, finance ministers don't do that. But uh, again, for I mean, that's who he was, and I think. Um, for anybody who knew him, they respected that and they understood it. And as I said, despite the fact that they had that public spat going on, I mean, the Global Risk Institute I mentioned earlier, I mean, there had to be a partnership and an agreement between Dwight and Jim personally to make though. that happen. Not too often. Let's, and let's it look happened. at what they, they disagreed on pensions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Kathleen Wynne wants to beef up the pensions, and uh, certainly Jim Flaherty never came on side for that. There were a bunch of other issues they just but did not agree on. But there were significant issues. And listen, yeah. let's, let's be clear. Back to the, uh, the sports analogy. The Jim Flaherty uh, I knew liked to play the game. He liked to play it vigorously. He liked to win. 
he didn't like to lose. My impression was he wasn't always, and I know the instinct because I share it myself, he wasn't always the easiest loser. And so I think sometimes when we saw that side of Jim, it was, I lost and I don't like losing. But on big ticket items, like the harmonization of the sales tax, on the auto bailout, notwithstanding oh, yes. the fact some people would say, well, of course, he's from Oshawa Whitby. Well, that may be all well and good, but I think Ernie particularly, and Janet as well, will know what probably Jim would have said theoretically about auto bailouts. But if you look at what the Harper and McGuinty governments did on tax harmonization and big industrial restructuring in the auto sector, two really significant files for the province of Ontario. I think the people of Ontario were well served by two different governments of two different parties working in common cause for, I think, a good result. And Steve, as a student of history, you know how often, how warm and fuzzy the relationship is between Ontario and Ottawa <laughs> all the much. time. Not too much. <laughs> Even when it's the same party. <laughs> that's think, right. I, that's think, right. I think his criticism of Ontario was really his way of sending the message that you guys are going down the wrong track here and I'm going to try to bring you back on the right one. How effectively do you think that worked? It obviously didn't work very effectively <laughs> in this particular case. Well, you saw Dwight Duncan. You saw Dwight Duncan in his last couple of years when he started to appreciate the significance of the, the fiscal challenge that Ontario had, trying to bring you know back you know some uh, austerity into their budgets and rein back really? some of the spending. Oh, <laughs> well, I haven't every, noticed. It. Well, everything's <laughs> relative. Everything's relative. Uh, but uh, you know, I mean, Duncan actually was, and McGinty were actually sort of trying to do that in their own inevitable way. Steve, before we, we before we run out of time, I do want to say something else about Jim Flaherty, and there's been some passing reference to it. Jim Flaherty represents, and he was very proud of this, um, the Irish tradition in Canadian politics. And one of the memories I have of Jim Flaherty, and I saw him two or three times at the Ireland Fund Dinner, massive oh, yes. event here in Toronto. Green and tie. He was never happier. He sat there, and if you knew Jim, and I, and I I've, I've followed him, I, I teach a course actually on the Irish and Canadian history, and a friend of mine, David uh, Wilson, is the authoritative biographer of Darcy McGee, and uh, David Wilson, a professor at the University of Toronto, was telling me one day about being at something, I think it was actually at the Albany Club that Jim Flaherty had organized to, to help launch the McGee uh, biography. But uh, Jim Flaherty um, belongs to a long tradition of uh, Irish men and women in Canadian politics, uh, Mul people with names like Brian Mulrooney, Brian Mulrooney mm -hmm. Frank McGee, Arthur Maloney, Edward Blake, and he was very proud of that. He would, uh, mm -hmm. he would wear that. I can still see him on, I wore some green tonight as tribute to you, <laughs> Jim, because as part of the tribe, uh, I was uh, always, uh, I, was, I was quite struck by uh, how much that seemed to mean to him. He was very proud of his Irish roots in the West End of Montreal. He went out of his way to go to Ireland any chance he could get. He made several speeches, I noticed, he got honorary degrees from Irish universities. And in some respects on this, the, what, 100, it's 100 and some, it's, this is the week on which Thomas Darcy McGee was assassinated. Mm -hmm. There was a quality of McGee in, in, uh, in Jim Flaherty that I think Flaherty would, would have wanted to uh, highlight uh, that I too can make a feisty speech and McGee <laughs> wasn't just the golden voice of Canadian Confederation. McGee could slice and dice an opponent as effectively as anyone and, uh, and so I just wanted to observe on this sad day that Jim Flaherty was among many things a very proud practitioner of the um, political art done the Irish way. <laughs> uh, Elizabeth Whitmer, we should talk a bit about his family because he was in a, it's an unusual situation to leave Queen's Park, run federally, and then have your spouse run for the same seat and win. And you had husband and wife representing the same riding federally and provincially for, I don't know how many years, how many years would have been? A few years anyway. 95 on. Well, now let me think. No, no he, was, he went no. 06 on, I guess. He was 10 yeah. 06 on. Yeah, yeah 2006 on. They had triplet boys. Yes. One of whom has some health issues, is somewhat disabled, challenges. Uh, do you think, I don't know, did you ever talk to Christine Elliott, his wife, and it, was that the source of their interest in people with disabilities in, with other associations and so on? Well, I think it certainly what was part of the reason that they focused um, on, on people with disabilities and uh, did everything they did to uh, you know, support that community and make sure that those people were included uh, in life. Um, Christine, I, I can tell you, uh, both Jim and Christine were very devoted to their three boys and uh, I know when Christine came to Queen's Park, uh, she always made sure that uh, you know somebody was there to look after the boys, and she would drive back and forth each day, and you know make sure that uh, 
she was there and uh, so uh, but she did have a very special and keen interest in those who were disabled and uh, I think a lot of it was a result of uh, having a son. You know, one of the things that I'll always remember is really interesting when Christine ran for the leadership, because he then there was a big debate. I, you know, this is I, against Tim Hudak. Yeah, against him, and uh, uh, there was a big debate about, you know, geez, should he be there? Because usually, you know, you have the spouse is there. Should he be there? Should he not? And always oh, he going to, you know? Anyway, as luck would have it, he ended up not being able to be there like legitimately. But the, he sent a tape. And the pride with which he, like, it was just so evident. He was so pleased that she was doing this. And it was like watching a, I don't know, a parent when their, their kid does something. I mean, it was just a really touching human moment watching him on the videotape. Uh, I was only, you almost felt like you were a voyeur watching a really <laughs> private exchange between the two of them. And I'll always remember that because, again, it was another side of him that, you know, people often didn't see. Well, you're going to talk the romance of politics. I'm going to talk brass knuckle politics because I remember those days, and I think he tried to call in a lot of markers to help her campaign, right? Yes, he did. And how did that work? Well, she lost, uh, and I think he, he took that, and again, I was with the two of them uh, at the end after the party it was over and, and they were going home and that, and he took it, I think, even worse than she did. I mean, again, it hurt, you know, because yeah. he, he loved her, he cared about her, and he'd fought very hard to try and make her the leader, because he thought she would have been a good mm -hmm. leader. So, again, it was just a very human moment. He, he a, was mm -hmm. very proud of Christy, mm -hmm. and I know that when they went to functions, he always, always made sure that, uh, you know what? she was recognized and, uh, and and he would talk about her very fondly and uh, the influence that she had on his life so it uh, you know there's a sadness today when you think of oh, the fact that uh, you know she's lost her husband and the boys have have lost a father and they didn't have the time after politics to spend together that's what this was supposed to be right that's he finally got out so they could have yes 10 15 20 years yeah. whatever you got exactly. left exactly to just enjoy life a bit. Exactly. And they got ripped off. Yeah. Yeah, Steve, absolutely. another human moment uh, that you and the cynical members of the Fourth Estate might like. <laughs> I remember one day, it would be about 2000, and uh, it was after a question period, or perhaps before, but it was Queen's Park, and a couple of uh, ministers uh, of the Harris government, none of whom is at this table, were complaining about what a difficult drive they had in their chauffeur-driven limousines to get the question period at Queen's Park or whatever. And Jim Flaherty came along and, I, and he overheard part of this conversation. And he said to one or both of them, as I recall, well, colleagues, you wouldn't have the problem if you came to work as I do on the GO train. <laughs> <laughs> and he was very proud of that GO train. He said to me, I remember talking to him on a couple of occasions, and uh, he was the, about the only cabinet minister I knew who was not only happy to take the GO train, but happy to tell you he'd taken the GO train. Probably kept him in touch with a lot of people that way as well. We've got uh, less than two minutes to go here. And, Sean, you are the sort of, if I can put it this way, Ontario historian authority around this table. And I'd ask you. Ernie Eves says he's the best finance minister in Canadian history. What do you say? Well, you know, um, he certainly, uh, it was a, I think it is a very significant tenure. And I, you know, I, I, I don't know, I was sort of closely associated with a certain Paul Martin on a major research project. <laughs> so he's probably someplace in the Eastern Townships watching this. So I'll have to be careful. But I think, I think there's no question. Uh, Flaherty uh, really did uh, have an very important uh, uh, tenure as Minister of Finance. And if he's not the most important, uh, uh, I think he has to rank with the first tier ministers of finance uh, in terms of the impact he and his government have made because they, uh, they changed the debate and uh, they made the weather. And the, the weather is very different in 2014 than it was uh, in 2006 when Jim Flaherty went to the Department of Finance. You're from Windsor? I'm Paul sorry. Martin's from Windsor? Yeah. And you think Jim Flaherty was better? I got along very well with Paul. Uh, you know, we did a lot of things together, and uh, you're talking about two governments working together with different political mm -hmm. stripes. Yes, I have nothing but the utmost respect for Paul Martin. But what Paul Martin didn't have to deal with, that Jim did, was the terrible economic shape that the world mm -hmm. was in, through no fault of his, through no fault of the Canadian government. Right. And he led. He led the world in, in coming out of the recession, the Western world. And he dragged a lot of nations kicking and screaming who didn't happen to agree with him. Well, Ernie Eves, you being the good St. Louis Cardinals baseball fan that you are, <laughs> would know when you get 3,000 hits, you're going to the Hall of Fame. Today is the 3,000th day of Jim Flaherty's political career. So I guess he's going to the Hall of Fame. I want to thank Ernie Eves, Elizabeth Whitmer, 
Janet Ecker, Sean Conway for coming in tonight and sharing your memories of Jim Flaherty on this day. Thanks so much, everybody. Jim Flaherty was, of course, a guest on TVO numerous times over the years. Here now is a look back at some of his appearances. Some people will be looking to you to cut spending, not actually prime the pump, but to cut spending in order that this country not get into a deficit situation you know, that becomes profound. Is that something you would entertain doing? No. Um, we're, we're not going to be ideological about, uh, about uh, not having a deficit or about running a surplus artificially. We will be ideological about the economy. That is, we will not take actions that will harm the real economy because that's harming Canadians' families, Canadian businesses, the ability to finance payrolls, finance inventories. So we won't go there. Does that represent a philosophical change in position for you? Um, it's not for me. I, I've always thought of myself as being pragmatic, and, and we have to be pragmatic at, at the end of the day. I mean, this isn't an academic exercise that we're engaged in. I'm not writing a book here. We're, we're governing, um, and it affects, it affects people's lives uh, day to day. So no, I don't, I don't view it as, as a philosophical change. Some people would be, and I know many of them, would be quite critical of me and have our government if we, if we do run a deficit, but I've been criticized before, that's okay. You usually are criticized though by liberals and new democrats. I'm talking about <laughs> the small c conservatives who remember you as a sort of a charter member of the Common Sense Revolution Club yeah. back in 1995, uh, which you were in the cabinet of, which you were a finance minister of, that's right. and they will wonder what's happened to Jim Flaherty's bona fides on this kind of stuff. What's the answer? Well, the, the answer is you have, you have to do the right thing. I mean, it, this, these are extraordinary times. I, I said that in the House of Commons yesterday. I don't know if the opposition really understand yet. It's not how, the opposition. It's well, conservatives who even, say even, even some, some uh, people who would call themselves fiscal conservatives, that a deficit at all costs will hurt our economy. Now, I'm still planning for, for balanced budgets going forward, but if we're not able to do that because we need to stimulate the economy, we're going to stimulate the economy because this is, this is an extraordinary time. No one who, who, is, uh, who didn't go through the Depression, and most people alive today were not alive during the Depression, uh, has an experience like the experience we're going through today. Are you still a common sense revolutionary? Oh, sure. Yeah, you are. I, I think so. I think those, those principles of being fiscally responsible and so on, you know, we, 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 would, have, we would have had a, a recession probably in 2001, 2002 in Ontario were it not for a strong housing sector, new housing starts in, in, in the province. And that's the kind of thing that one can stimulate. But the kinds of conversations people are having nowadays, I'll make this my last question, suggest that we're into a dramatically new everything, like business, labor, and government as co-equal partners in almost every big thing going forward. Mm -hmm. And I would not have thought that that was in your traditional wheelhouse. Are you telling me it is now? Well, you have to do what, what needs to be done to protect the economy. That's the bottom line, not some sort of ideological position. I'm going to infer from that that, you've actually, that you have evolved. I think you have. <laughs> I mean, it, it seems to me that you have, because you wouldn't have said this 10 years ago. I wasn't faced with this 10 years ago. Okay, let's take advantage of your being in that chair to do a little budget making 101 here. Since we are coming up to the budget, you haven't set the date yet, have you? But we know it's the end of March, something like that? It'll be in March, yeah. It'll be in March, <laughs> sometime in March. You delivered, I think if memory serves, one budget for the Ontario government when yeah. you were in provincial politics, and now this is going to be budget number six for you as the federal finance minister. Has anything changed about the way you approach budget making over your years? If anything, I'm more cautious than I ever was. And I think, I think that's just experience. It's going through that economic downturn, the recession that we had, that really was. Cautious in what respect? Um, I, I'm, I'm cautious in, in, the, in what advice I listen to. I mean, I listen broadly, um, but I'm very conscious of self-interest um, that, that, that many have. Um, I'm also conscious of the political reality that my colleagues on both sides of the house, including my own side, you know, all believe in, in, a, in a macro way in restraint, but not when it comes to their own writings and their own projects. Shock. <laughs> you know, so I, yeah. yeah, so I, I may not end up being the most popular member of the House of Commons. But, uh, you know, I, I, I am cautious about all those things. Priority making is very important. I'm much more direct than I used to be about at the beginning of the process saying, what are we trying to accomplish here? And, and, and what are the two or three or maybe four main things and, and to try to focus on those things and not be distracted by the, the numerous good projects and good ideas that people have. Like but arenas that, in Quebec City? Sure. And, and well, yeah, and, and, and there are always good things and tax breaks for charitable donations, all sorts of good ideas that come up. Um, but we need to stay on track, we need to stay focused, and we need to have a, a coherent narrative about what we're doing. The country needs direction. 
Whom does a finance minister consult with to get good advice on making a budget? Well, I, I obviously I consult with the Prime Minister. Uh, he and I work closely together. This is the sixth time we've done this, so we know each other quite well. We don't always agree, um, but... Who wins when you disagree? Hmm, that's good. Sometimes me, <laughs> believe it or not, sometimes he, he's, it, it's not someone winning, it's someone acknowledging... Well, prevailing. Yeah, it's, it's acknowledging the argument that the other person is making about the usefulness of a particular idea. Can you give idea. us an example of that? Where the two of you may have not been on the same page and ultimately you convinced him? Um, I probably shouldn't, but on some of the issues relating to how long how long we would let some tax programs run, and, and so not business taxes, but other, other issues. Uh, we've had different concepts about uh, duration of things. Um, in the economic action plan, we had uh, naturally some, some concerns about how large it should be, because we're running a big deficit. Um, and uh, and we, you know, we ended up deciding to run a big deficit because of the, the risk of, of double-digit employment. It was quite a frightening time. I know people forget that quickly. And, and the opposition forgets it quickly. Some of them, the, the journalists forget it quickly too. But it was, we went through a big trough. And, and you know, when you're in the trough, you don't know when you're going to start climbing up the mountain again. It was frightening. So you consult the Prime Minister, presumably your economists in the ministry. Yeah. Uh, what, what interest groups get to meet the Minister of Finance to give their advice? Um, I, well, I meet with the, with the uh, small business representatives. I meet with, I meet with the big sectors. Um, you know, the auto sector, the, uh, the petrochemical sector, the resource sector, the mining sector, um, the uh, aviation sector. I meet with all, all of the big sectors as well. I meet with the broad groups, the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. And I have a, a wonderful thing that we created in the recession. It was because of the recession. We created it in December 2008, an Economic Advisory Council, which has uh, 10 people on it, all prominent Canadian men and women, all in business. And um, they come and give me advice about every quarter. We have a one day together. Who chairs that? Mm -hmm. that, that is chaired by Janice McKinnon, who's a oh, yeah. former NDP Minister of Finance in Saskatchewan. Talk about strange bedfellows. <laughs> but okay. <laughs> well, but she's, a, she's a fiscally responsible person, I can assure you. Uh, but we've had her on the program many times. She yeah. reminds us of that. Yeah. Um, does a Minister of Finance necessarily meet with his opposition critics in crafting a budget? Yes. Yeah, it's very them? important. Yes. The block as well? Yes. I just met with the block critic, Mr. Payet, and I had a good conversation in, uh, oh, two weeks ago now. And, you know, they had a long list of demands, and, and you know, it was more than $5 billion, so obviously we're not going not to do those. <laughs> um, but there are individual items with respect to which we can, we can make progress. Same with the NDP. I, m I met with Thomas McClure before Christmas, and there are some ideas there that we can, wor we can work with. Um, the Liberals, yes, except they, they want to have big new spending programs, and I, you know, that's not in the cards this year. Does a Minister of Finance ever, even gently, tip his hand after those kinds of meetings saying, I like that idea, thank you? Yeah. You do do that? Yes, and, and we've incorporated some of their ideas in, in, in the budget, and there are a few ideas on the table now this year, some, you know, at least one relating to seniors that I'm going to talk to them some more about. Um, about how we craft things. It is a minority government. I mean, we do not have a majority. We have to work with the opposition. We also have to govern. We have to have a clear direction. Do you meet with provincial finance ministers? Yes, we meet uh, twice a year. But I mean in terms of the budget? Uh, the budget, no. We talk, we talk more informally about that. I spoke with two of them this week. Um, and I'll speak, with, I'll speak with others. So we, you know, we have good communications going back and forth. My concern with a couple of the provinces is their own fiscal probity. <laughs> Uh, is, is making a budget a 12-month-a-year endeavor? Um, it's always, it, we're all, there are always ideas coming forward. So in that sense, yes, it's a continuous endeavor. Um, but but it, really is, it really is more like a four- to six-month endeavor um, where, where we do the intensive consultations, the intensive listening, and sort through priorities and decide what we're actually going to do. A lot of the decision-making is what not to do rather than what gets done. A couple more things. Uh, given that you've done budgets at both the provincial and federal level, is there any difference in how you make a budget at a provincial level versus a federal level? Yes, and, and, and you know, my provincial colleagues and I talk about this regularly. Healthcare dominates provincial budget making. The Minister of Finance in, in a province might as well be the Minister of Health as well. Hmm. Um, that's not true federally. We have more scope federally and we have more, uh, more opportunities federally. And last question. Um, 
I know Paul Martin, when he was finance minister, used to get up in front of the mirror and practice that speech over and over and over because he appreciated the importance of not just having the numbers be good, but his performance be good. Obviously, it sets a tone, conveys confidence or not, etc. Do you do that? I, I, I practice it. I read it. I don't do it in front of a mirror. Um, but, yeah, I practice it. I make sure I'm, I'm familiar with the, the speech. I actually find it a relief because it means the job is done. Um, the reef really comes a day or two before the speech is ready, the budget is ready, the decisions are made. Um, the only anxiety relating to it is how it will be received, and you hope you've made the right decisions. Um, but, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, it's, it's, uh, it's another speech in Parliament. You need the confidence of Parliament for the government to carry on. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.